I want to start with you, Madam Secretary. You've been so frank about the threats that you and your family have faced. And there was just something reminiscent. I mean, I know the January 6th Select Committee played the footage of the riders outside of your home. I know you testified to being inside with your young child. Um, one of the shootings in New Mexico um, involved a real bullet that went into the real bedroom of a real 10-year-old. What was this news like for you to process? It was all um, it was chilling, um, and it was all too familiar. And it really underscores how the status quo is unsustainable and unacceptable. We should not, and we need to stop being surprised when violent threats and this hateful rhetoric transcends into hateful actions. It has happened over and over and over again as a direct extension of the lies and the falsehoods that many intentionally and knowingly spread about our elections and our democracy. This is not who we are. It's not who we can continue to be. And we need folks on both sides of the aisle to say enough is enough. Do you see that happening on both sides of the aisle, people saying enough is enough, Madam Secretary? No, not to the extent we need it to, and not, you know, despite the fact that voters spoke clearly last November and said enough is enough, rejecting candidates who spewed these lies and this hateful rhetoric. Still, we see so many trying to gain power and raise money uh, and just gain attention by spreading this misinformation. So, you know, to, we also need to see consequences. Uh, it's not enough to just expect people to change. So, for example, today we announced in Michigan we're going to try to pass legislation to increase the penalties for threatening, harassing, doxing election officials or election workers. And we really just need to take this seriously from a legal standpoint. Uh, as well as demand more and demand better from all of our leaders. Frank Figluzzi, um, I, I just want to put some dots on the board and have you um, give us your analysis of how they're connected. Uh, January 6th, hundreds now, maybe we're up to 1,000 rioters prosecuted for their violent act and the abuse and, and physical abuse um, they carried out against law enforcement officials, a shooter, an FBI field office after the court approved Mar-a-Lago search, the attack on Speaker Pelosi's husband, Paul Pelosi, and now New Mexico. All of them related, all of them linked, all of them instigated, and the logical outcome of five years or more of demonizing the other, of making it okay if you don't like what happened po politically, if the election didn't come out your way, it's okay to storm the Capitol. It's okay to challenge until you, every judge in your state has said, there's no challenge to be had. It's okay for Carrie Lake in Arizona to still to this day claim that she won and it's rigged. And it's all been generated largely by one individual who really has to be the one to come out and say, I condemn this kind of violence. I don't stand for this anymore. And it's not going to happen. There's quite the opposite will happen here. He feeds on this. It strengthens him, and he continues to dupe people literally into losing their freedom or even their life uh, at the hands of law enforcement because they're acting out violently because of some proverbial chip that's been implanted in their head that says violence is okay because those people over there are evil. They've been demonized. And that's what happened. If you, you know, as the police in, interrogate this individual in New Mexico, he's likely to swear up and down that it's all rigged. The system is rigged against him. Um, and therefore, it's justified to do what he did. But I'm going to get on my soapbox just real briefly here. And, and so I've given you the warning. Here it comes. <laughs> this is domestic terrorism. What happened in New Mexico is domestic terrorism. And we still, Nicole, you know what I'm going to say, to this day, don't have a federal domestic terrorism law. This guy is the poster child for why we need a federal domestic terrorism law. This is politically based violence. And for those who say, well, wait a minute, uh, we've successfully gone after Oath Keepers leaders and charged Proud Boys leaders with seditious conspiracy. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that is those laws don't match what happened in New Mexico. The, what, what this guy did was politically motivated terrorism, but it wasn't against the U.S. federal government. So this is the example of why we need a domestic terrorism statute. 
Um, Frank, you can stay on your soapbox for a second. Um, you might need to be there to answer this question, maybe not. So the New Mexico mayor lists what this is, right? He says this is, quote, right-wing radical election denial, and it has come to our community. Is it coming to every community? Is anyone immune? There's no evidence that it's limited to any one particular state. We can go state after state, election after election, where people who lost claim it was rigged and then go after people. Fulton County, Georgia, look at what happened to the election workers there at their homes. Uh, Eric Swalwell, some guy's just been fired for threatening the life of Congressman Eric Swalwell because he doesn't like his politics. It's everywhere. Plot to kidnap the governor in Michigan because of her political decision making. It's no one is immune from this. And it, from a law enforcement perspective, it creates a real challenge because what essentially has to happen is lo local and state law enforcement have to monitor. And by the way, they're not equipped to do it. Um, elections to see, OK, is this guy who lost? Is he lost his mind? Are we getting you know, they have to almost provide defensive briefings to county and state election officials saying, look, if somebody comes to your home and complains about the rigged election, we need to know about that because we need to start monitoring the possibility of a violent threat. This changes the dynamic for local and state law enforcement. And let me be clear, the victims aren't all Democratic officials. Let me just show you, Garrett. This is um, some of the footage created by the January 6th Select Committee in preparation for their public hearings. Um, this is a mix of officials that span the ideological spectrum being targeted with political violence. There is nowhere I feel safe. Nowhere. Do you know how it feels to have the president of the United States to target you. Wishing death upon me, um, telling me that, you know, I'm, I'll be in jail with my mother and saying things like, be glad it's 2020 and not 1920. When I saw the gun, I knew I had to get close. And at the same time, on some of these we had a daughter who was gravely ill, who was upset by what was happening outside. Garrett, it's not a whodunit. Donald Trump did it. Donald Trump did it. And Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy, by letting him cry it out after November, made all those people human targets for political violence. What's the response today? Well, from the right, it's, there's been basically none. I mean, look, I think you, you have to look at this from a slightly broader perspective. I mean, Trump is the kind of has an immediate triggering effect on this. But if you look at the right wing ecosystem when it comes to political violence and generally, there's much more challenging dynamic here at play. This combination of, uh, you know, apocalyptic rhetoric about stolen elections and the failure of democracy, the idea that it's not just any one election that's been, you know, triggered by fraud, but that the very essence of democracy is being taken away from you, combined with this kind of Second Amendment absolutism and, and fetish, fetishization of guns. I'm looking at the warrant here for the arrest of Solomon Pena, and in one of the pictures, one of his accomplices, and you won't see this very well on TV, is sitting at a table with seven or eight guns kind of arrayed in front of him. The combination of that kind of political apocalyptic viewpoint and, a, and an attitude towards firearms that says we're going to have them, we're going to have a bunch, we're going to carry them with us everywhere we go, creates the environment where anybody, you know, there, there are unstable people all across the political spectrum, but if you sort of subscribe, if you check those other two boxes, you create the environment in which this situation happens. And if you add someone like a Donald Trump to that, you do create a very dangerous and difficult situation. And to build on Frank's point, you know, this is a case where Solomon Pena lost his election by 50 percentage points. If this was a rigging, it was a very, very effective rigging. There's no uh, opportunity for law enforcement to say this is a case where we should watch out, that someone might be an election denier. This wasn't one that was close, that somebody might be worried about a ballot box being stuffed. I mean, this is not the kind of thing that would even be on that radar. Should local police departments have radar find Finally tuned enough to pick this up. I mean, Nicole, it is a pervasive problem. There were 9,000 recorded threats against members of Congress in 2021, the last complete year we have the numbers. That's more than 25 threats a day. 
that are reported to the Capitol Police. Who knows how many more go beyond that? I mean, the scope of this problem is massive, and, and there's not a good handle on it from a law enforcement perspective or a political perspective right now.